Okay, great. Hi, everyone. So welcome to another video here from The Spoonful of Oral Medicine. I'm very pleased to have Dr. David. David and I um, first got to know each other, I think, on online, on via social media. And then we realized that we had actually met at several scientific um, events in the past, including the World Workshop of Oral Medicine. So one of the yeah. things that I really like is that technology is bringing people closer together across the world, which is really nice. Yeah, really, really nice. All right. So for people that are not familiar with the format of these videos, what I do is that I invite a special guest who is David with me here today. And we and I go through Google to find the most commonly asked questions about a certain topic. Today, we're going to be talking about oral lichen planus. Now, the guest hasn't seen the questions before. It's going to be a little bit of an informal chat. And without further ado, let's get started. Let's do it. All right. So as I mentioned, we're talking about oral lichen planus. So David yes. is a clinical assistant professor of oral medicine at San Antonio. Um, he received his DDS from the Santa Maria University School of Dentistry in Venezuela. And then he entered a combined training program in oral surgery and oral pathology in Colombia. Upon graduation, he started private practice and he actively participated in the Venezuelan Academy of Oral Medicine. And then, he began, and then he began a one-year oral medicine and oral facial pain fellowship at NYU. And then he com completed a two-year residency at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Medicine, and he's currently full-time faculty. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Amanda, for having me here. So the first question, what is oral lichen planus? Well, I'm going to explain this exactly as I explained it to my students but mostly to my patients, okay? So lichen planus is going to be a chronic inflammatory mucocutaneous autoimmune disease, okay? And I'm going to explain every single one of those words. It's going to be chronic because we don't have a, a cure for this. This is a condition that is going to be with the patient for a long, long time, maybe for the rest of their life. It's inflammatory because it's inflammatory in nature. In, in nature. We're going to have a lot of inflammation going on wherever this condition presents. It's mucocutaneous, that means that the condition can present in the skin, but can also present in the mucosa. Mucosa meaning the wet skin of the body, inside the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the genitals. And it's autoimmune because this is one of the conditions where the body reacts against your own body for reasons that we don't understand, okay? And that's what makes lichen planus just one of the hundreds different autoimmune diseases that we have, like pemphigos, pemphigoid, lupus, and Sjogren's, and so many others, okay? So this is going to be an autoimmune disease that is going to be able to affect your skin and the mucosa of your body in an inflammatory way. Now, how common is oral lichen planus? Lichen planus is actually pretty common, and I'm still surprised that Sometimes I see patients and they have been dealing with these conditions in their mouth for two, three years. And when I tell them, you have lichen planus, just as looking at their mucosa, they're like, what is that? I have never, I have never heard that term before. And I have seen seven dentists, one ENT and two primary care physicians. So I don't know in those instances who is more surprised if the patient or me. Lichen planus is actually very, very common. Um, lichen planus is the dermatologic condition that most commonly presents in the mouth. And the prevalence is estimated to be 2% in the general population. At that no and that number can be an underestimation because so many patients with lichen planus can be asymptomatic. That means on the diagnose, just walking in the street. But around 2% of the general population is believed that have lichen planus. And when you put that in perspective, that's a lot of people living with lichen planus with oral lichen planus. Yeah. Um, who commonly gets oral lichen planus? What is the most popular subtype of patient that you see? Lichen planus is definitely more common in females between 50 to 60 years. I think the mean age of diagnosis is 55 years old. Yeah. yeah that definitely. doesn't mean that other patients can't have it. I have seen lichen planus, of course, in males, and I have seen very few cases in teenagers. Yeah, that's that's pretty similar to me as well. Same type of patients that we see. Okay. 
So are there different kinds of oral lichen planus? Well, lichen planus is one disease. It's one disease that can present in many different ways. And those are the clinical presentations or the clinical patterns. And there are six different clinical patterns described. And those are reticular, erosive, atrophic, bolus, plaque-like, and papular. Yes, yeah. And yeah. although there are six different types of lichen planus in the mouth, the most common ones are atrophic, erosive, reticular, and plaque-like. So even though there are six, you can classify pretty much all of them in these three or four, depending on, on, on the type of practice that you have for the type of patient that you see. Now, have you seen um, bullets like in planus? Well, sometimes it's very difficult to see bullets like in planus because clinically you don't really know where you're looking at. So like in planus, as I said, it's very versatile in the way that it presents. And one of the ways that it presents is in a common term or an umbrella term that we use that is called desquamative gingivitis. And that can be used or that can be a form that you can see where the patient has erosive lichen planus, atrophic lichen planus, or bullous lichen planus. As you may know, it's very difficult to see bulla or vesicles in the mouth because we constantly chew and speak and talk and move the lips, our tongue and everything. And that pops up those very thin membranes and it's very difficult to see it. So you may need to do um, a biopsy. And even though in the biopsy is very difficult to determine because these are clinical patterns. So you need to be lucky enough to see the vesicle in the mouth that the patient has it. Mm. So we've already described this a little bit. Can it affect other parts of the body? And I suppose what that would look like. Uh, outside yeah, of the definitely. Like in planos, as I said at the beginning, is, at the beginning is an autoimmune disease that can affect the skin and the mucosa. When it presents in the skin, presents with a typical presentation that is called PPPPP because pretty purple, polygonal, and purple, okay? That's the way that this condition presents in the skin. So we were talking about other areas where it can present. So at the beginning, I said it can present in the skin and in the mouth, but also can present in other mucosa, inside the eyes, in the nose, and in the genitals. And when presents in the genitals, present very similarly as, as it present in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in the skin, if I'm not mistaken, there are 20 different patterns of lichen planus, okay? So in the mouth, it's kind of easy because we have six and we can classify them only in three. But in the skin, it's a little bit more challenging. They have so many different presentations. So can oral lichen planus, or I suppose lichen planus, can it be serious? Lichen planus itself is not, a, is not a serious condition. Like in planus is a benign condition that unfortunately we don't have a cure, but with treatment, we can get the patient to the point that they don't even remember that they have like in planus. We have medications that work pretty effectively. And although we cannot cure them, um, we can make the patient feel really, really good. The problem with like in planus, and this is kind of a controversial topic, is that it has malignant potential okay like it's been described that like in planus has the ability to become pre-malignant or malignant over many many years um can you sort of explain the difference between a oral lichenoid lesion and lichen planus yes lichen planus is going to be oh this is how i explain to my students it's kind of the true disease is that through autoimmune disease where the patient is going to react to endogenous and also exogenous antigens, okay, that can present in the mucosa or in the skin. However, lichen reactions is not a true disease. It's kind of an allergic reaction. Just imagine it's kind of an allergic reaction. It's going to be an immune response pretty similar to the ones that we see in allergic reaction, but this is going to be directly associated to an external agent. That can be a medication, that can be a dental material, or that can be as a consequence of surgical procedures like a bone marrow um, 
and transplant, for example. So how do you treat oral lichen planus? So patients, some patients with lichen planus can be asymptomatic. And if the patient is asymptomatic, we don't really need to do much. However, if the patient presents with symptoms, the first line therapy is going to be with steroids. We can use the steroids systemically or topically. I always start with topical um, steroids, but really depends on the severity of the condition. When we talk about the topical steroids, we can prescribe just a gel to the patient and just imagine the patient has one lesion in the tip of the tongue or one lesion here in the lower lip that is super easy just to apply a gel once or twice a day and that's it. Or some patients present with more widespread conditions where I prefer to prescribe a solution or elixir so they can do mouthwash. That's one way that we can treat it. Um, some patients present with recalcitrant lesions, lesions that never heal. Mm -hmm. And if we have only one lesion, we can do intralesional injections with steroids. Mm -hmm. In some other patients, we just can decide to prescribe systemic steroids. This is prednisone, methylprednisone, or prednisone, depending on your preference or your experience. And we can also treat the patients with calcineidone inhibitors. I like to prescribe calcineidone inhibitors in the form of ointment, and I use it mostly for the lips. Mm -hmm. I don't use it too much inside the mouth because since it's an ointment, the addition to the mucosa is more difficult. There are some other treatments that have been described doxycycline, dapson, but those are medicated and other immunomodulators, cyclosporin, mycophenolate, mofetil, so many other agents that we, as an oral medicine specialist, most of the cases, we can really control it. Can stress make lichen planus worse? Definitely. The relationship between lichen planus, anxiety, depression, and the stress is huge. And there are so many different studies trying to find a correlation between these conditions. However, it's been very difficult and none of them have been able to demonstrate how is the relationship. I believe the relationship is bidirectional. For example, if you're a patient that has anxiety and um, you also have lichen planus when your sinus, when your symptoms of anxiety exacerbate, also your lichen planus is going to exacerbate. The situation here is that we don't know what it was first. Was the lichen planus and maybe was asymptomatic and now you are anxious and you are hyper aware of everything or vice versa. But yes, it's, it's for sure that there is a clear relationship between psychopathologies and psychological stress and lichen planus, and there are hundreds of articles in this topic. Mm, I agree with you. So my patients, when they are stressed, their lichen planus definitely does seem to present more acutely. Mm. Definitely. So this is from a patient's perspective. So how would a patient know if they have oral lichen planus? So what I will tell a patient is don't look for lichen planus <laughs> because patients, they start to look for things in the mouth and they're going to find things. If you look for things, you are going to find things. The most common symptoms of what my patients re report more commonly is soreness, sensitivity to a spicy food, to citrus, to citrus food, um, pain discomfort, very few reports bleeding, or yes, yeah, few reports bleeding when they, when they brush. It's very common here, the patient saying, I have blisters. And when you open the mouth, it's not really blister, but that's the way that they describe what they see or what they think in the mouth, okay? But yes, definitely soreness, sensitivity to certain food, oral hygiene products, and some patients are able to see white and red patches in the mouth. Those are the most common um, complaints of the mm. or, or their dentist sees it and then tells them about it if they are asymptomatic. Exactly. But if the patient really wants to know if they have lichen planus, they definitely need to go to an oral medicine specialist or a pathologist, an oral surgeon, or any dentist um, mm. should have the ability to guide you through the diagnosis process.
either they can do the biopsy and the assessment themselves, or they will refer you to someone that can help you. I've added some of my clinical photos here for you to have a look at the presentations that we were describing before. So thank you very much for your time. Um, for anybody that is on Instagram, um, David's Instagram handle is Dr. Oral Med, and I've put some of my stuff up there too. And yeah, once again, thank you.